We'll go ahead and get started. First of all, uh, thank you to those of you who are joining us today in person and to those of who are joining us by live stream. My name is Du Bois Bowman, and I have the privilege of serving as the Dean of the School of Public Health here at the University of Michigan. I'm delighted to be with you to celebrate Dr. Tedros uh, Gebreyesus, uh, the Director General of the World Health Organization and the fourth recipient of the Thomas Francis Jr. Medal in Global Public Health. The University of Michigan awards the medal to individuals who've made significant contributions to the advancement of global public health. It's one of the highest uh, honors granted by the university. The medal honors the legacy of Dr. Thomas Francis Jr., who's known for groundbreaking work in influenza and also the polio vaccine. Dr. Francis was the first person to isolate the influenza virus and discovered multiple strains that he then used to develop methodology for vaccine development. His vaccine methodology was ultimately foundational to his former student, Jonas Salk, developing the polio vaccine. Together, Francis and Salk conducted trials on 1.8 million children in the United States, Finland, and Canada, which was a monumental and unprecedented achievement. And then it was on the steps of Rackham Auditorium right here on the University of Michigan campus that Francis announced to the world the findings of the vaccination trials. And polio would soon be eradicated from the United States and the world within a decade. The medal was founded in 2005 on the 50th anniversary of Dr. Francis' historic announcement of the success of the polio vaccine trials. And it recognizes individuals who've uh, advanced global health through major scientific discovery or invention, leadership in the development, implementation, or promotion of effective public health policy, or seminal support for the development, implementation of effective action that advances global public health. Past recipients include Dr. William Fagey, Alfred Summer, and Sir, Fa Sir Fazle Hassan Abid, uh, and I think all of you would agree that Dr. Tedros is a most worthy recipient. As we begin today's event, I want to also thank members of the selection committee who evaluated all of the nominations for this medal. I had the privilege of chairing the search committee, and from the beginning, you can imagine the number of worthy applications, but, the, but, but I think the moment... Uh, is right, the time is right to, sign, to, to uh, honor all of the worthy accomplishments of, of, of Dr. Tedros. I'd also like to thank the planning committee members who worked diligently to organize this wonderful ceremony today, but as well as uh, the many other people across the University of Michigan campus who have worked to, on other events taking place today and tomorrow. If you haven't had a chance to uh, attend other sessions, they are available by recording, uh, and I encourage you to do so. And then I want to thank Dr. Tedros for, for being here and sharing his time with us today uh, on this fantastic day of celebrations. As we all know, public health is critical to all of our lives and to the health and well-being of communities across the world. Public health is inherently global, and it's critical that we work together to make the world a healthier and more equitable place for everyone. I'm excited to explore this important topic today with Dr. Tedros and our esteemed panelists and guests. Now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Santa Ono, the 15th president of the University of Michigan to share more about the celebrations today. Thank you very much for that introduction, Dean Bowman. And congratulations again on your reappointment as Dean of our School of Public Health. Let's hear it for him. I'm so grateful to you and your colleagues for life-changing, life-saving work that you and your team are leading at our School of Public Health. I'd also like to thank the distinguished members of the Selection Committee uh, for the time and deliberation that they've offered in coming to this uh, decision in terms of this year's recipient. We so appreciate your work in making this award possible. I've been told that Reverend Mary Jane Francis, the daughter of Thomas Francis Jr., may also be watching us virtually. So thank you. We're so grateful for this opportunity to continue 
your father's legacy, of which we are so proud at this institution. Finally, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon, either here in this hall or virtually. As Dean Bowman described, we've gathered to present one of University of Michigan's most prestigious honors, the Thomas Francis Award to Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, the Director General of the World Health Organization. It's so fitting that the honor is for service and will be given to one who has served so well and given so much. For that is our shared commitment with you. For more than 200 years, the University of Michigan has been dedicated to serving society through excellence in research and education and service. We were the first university to open a hospital associated with the university in 1869. We began teaching public health in 1881. In the early 1940s, two outstanding University of Michigan doctors, Thomas Francis Jr. and his then young mentee, Jonas Salk, developed the first flu shot. As Dean Du Bois described, about a decade later, Thomas Francis Jr. announced the successful clinical trial of the polio vaccine. As he said, within one decade of that announcement, the terrible scourge of polio was eliminated from this country and eventually most of the world, not all of the world, but most of it. Yet new challenges have arisen, as we've all experienced. Diseases are relentlessly changing. Viruses are constantly evolving and mutating, taking new forms in their remorseless drive to reproduce. COVID-19, cancers, drug-resistant bacteria, global inequities and emerging diseases continue to threaten, steal, and destroy our common well-being. Thankfully, we have the renewing power to adapt and to learn, to transform and to heal, and to share our knowledge and findings around the world. Today, we're applying tools unimaginable decades ago to address new threats and new challenges to public health. From sophisticated biostatistics analysis using machine learning to the new generation of RNA vaccines that were so critical in this most recent pandemic. And here at the University of Michigan, our School of Public Health remains at the lead, a top-ranked program unto itself, along with highly-ranked programs of biostatistics and healthcare management, and certainly Michigan medicine. Nearly 200 faculty and researchers across the school's six departments train more than 1,300 graduate and undergraduate students each year. Lives are dedicated to compassion, innovation, inclusion, and impact. The school also has more than 90 global health faculty working in 76 countries around the world. And over the past five years, it has provided funding to support more than 225 masters and doctoral students for international internships focused on research, practice, training, and capacity building. It runs the Minority Health and Health Disparities International Research Training Program, a program for underrepresented students that has training sites around the world. So it's appropriate that we are here honoring Dr. Tedros today, for his life has been dedicated to transforming global health and lifting those in need. The first African and first non-medical doctor to lead the World Health Organization. Dr. Tedros has been deeply engaged in global health initiatives related to HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. He led WHO during the COVID-19 pandemic, 
And certainly that wasn't easy. And it has taken innovative intercontinental approaches to preventing disease and improving health and equity in our interconnected and global society. Today, Dr. Tedros remains set in his purpose, and I can tell you he's passionate about those he serves. He's passionate for those who are most in need. And he declared, our vision is not health for some. It's not health for most. It's health for all, rich and poor, able and disabled, old and young, urban and rural, citizen and refugee, everyone, everywhere. Dr. Tedros, we're so pleased to honor you here at the University of Michigan. Just spending a little bit of time with you yesterday evening, I was deeply moved by your passion, by your compassion, and we are very honored to have you here. To present the award, I'd like to invite Regent Catherine White to join me on stage. Regent White recently won her fourth term, which has set her to tie the record of Regent Beale, our longest serving regent. I'm so grateful to Regent White for her service and leadership at the University of Michigan. To me, you have been an invaluable guide, a sounding board, and a friend. In addition to her work with us, Regent White is a professor of law at Wayne State University Law School in Detroit, a deputy commander of the 46th Military Police Command in Lansing, a Fulbright scholar in Germany, and a registered patent attorney. Regent White, thanks, thanks again. We look forward to your award remarks for Dr. Tedros. Regent White. President Ono, thank you so much for that kind introduction. We so enjoyed having this wonderful inauguration for you last week. On behalf of the Board of Regents, I am honored to present this award to Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus. Your contributions to the advancement of global public health during your tenure as the director of, the, of WHO, I'm sorry, WHO Director General, have contributed to a healthier future for everyone all over the world. Thank you for your steadfast commitment to improving the quality of life for so many. Now please everyone turn your attention to a short video. The University of Michigan is proud to present Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus with the Thomas Francis Jr. Medal in Global Public Health an award with a rich and storied history at U of M. In 1954, in the face of a virulent polio epidemic, University of Michigan epidemiologist Thomas Francis Jr. spearheaded large-scale trials of a new polio vaccine developed by his protege, Jonas Salk. The world breathed a sigh of relief the following year when Dr. Francis announced from U of M's Rackham Auditorium that the vaccine trials had been a success. In 2005, on the 50th anniversary of this historic announcement, the University of Michigan established the Thomas Francis Jr. Medal in Global Public Health to honor Dr. Francis and those individuals who have made significant contributions to the advancement of global public health. It is one of the highest recognitions granted by the university. This year's recipient, World Health Organization Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, is renowned for his tireless work to combat global diseases, promote women and children's health, and transform the WHO into a more effective and equitable organization. Born in 1965 in Asmara, Eritrea, at the time part of Ethiopia, Dr. Tedros was strongly affected by his brother's death in early childhood most likely from measles, a preventable disease. After graduating from the University of Asmara with a Bachelor of Biology degree, he earned a Master of Science in Immunology of Infectious Diseases from the University of London, a PhD in Community Health from the University of Nottingham, 
and an honorary fellowship from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He then returned to Ethiopia to support the delivery of health services, first working as a field-level malariologist and later heading a regional health service. Appointed as Ethiopia's Minister of Health in 2005 and inspired by the universal health coverage he'd experienced during his studies in Europe, Dr. Tedros led far-reaching reform efforts. He expanded Ethiopia's health infrastructure, developed innovative health financing mechanisms, and increased its health workforce to reach people even in the most remote areas. Among his most groundbreaking achievements was the creation of a primary health care extension program that enlisted 40,000 female health workers throughout the country, leading to a 60% reduction in child and maternal mortality. Deaths from malaria and HIV infection also saw dramatic drops during his tenure. When he became Ethiopia's Minister of Foreign Affairs in 2012, Dr. Tedros continued to prioritize health regionally, nationally, and globally. This included his negotiation of the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, in which 193 countries committed to a new global framework for financing sustainable development. He also played a pivotal leadership role in the Africa Union's response to the West African Ebola epidemic. Dr. Tedros began to take on more roles with a global reach, including as chair of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, chair of the Rollback Malaria Partnership, and co-chair of the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health Board. In 2017, Dr. Tedros became the first African to be elected Director General of the World Health Organization. In this position, he has initiated the most significant transformation in the WHO's history, promoted universal health care, and worked to advance gender equality. When presented with the unprecedented challenge of managing the COVID-19 pandemic, he navigated the tumult with steady leadership and advocated for a more equitable response to the disease. For his outstanding dedication to the improvement of public health around the world and unwavering support of the underserved, the University of Michigan is pleased to present Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus with the 2023 Thomas Francis Jr. Medal in Global Public Health. Dr. Tedros, would you please join us on stage? President Santa Ono, Dean Bowman, and Regent Katie White, dear students, members of faculty, colleagues, and friends, thank you so much for your kind introduction, and I'm deeply honored to be here. President Ono, my warmest congratulations on your appointment and your inauguration last week. I have been touring the city and I have seen the <laughs> posters. <laughs> I'm deeply humbled and proud to accept this award, named in honor of the great Dr. Thomas Francis, Jr. As one of the world's leading experts in influenza and polio, Dr. Francis left a legacy that has endured for decades, and that could very well endure forever with the final eradication of polio. This award has an extra level of meaning 
for me because of my relationship with the University of Michigan, which goes back many years to my time as Minister of Health. By the way, this is my third time to come here. The first time was in 2011, second time was 2017, six years after the first trip, and then this one is 2023, six years from 2017. I don't know why I end up here every six years. Um, with the university's support, uh, we established the first obstetrics and gynecology residency in Ethiopia, the first renal transplant unit, and a new curriculum for medical students that could mean that meant they started seeing patients under supervision from the first day of their studies. The university has made a massive difference to the health of many people in Ethiopia, especially some of the poorest and most vulnerable uh, girls and women. And I offer my deep gratitude to the university for pioneering work and especially to Dr. Sanait Fasaha, to Dr. Joe Collars, and to Dr. Tim Johnson and others. This past Saturday marked three years since WHO first said that the global outbreak of COVID-19 could be described as a pandemic. It was a significant moment and one that garnered the attention of the world's media. However, from WHO's perspective, the far more significant moment came six weeks earlier, on the 30th of January 2020, when I declared the public health emergency of international concern. At the time, there were fewer than 100 reported cases of COVID-19 outside China and no reported deaths outside China. Three years later, there are almost 7 million reported deaths from COVID-19, although we know that the true number of deaths is much higher. However, we're certainly in a much better position now that we have been at any time during the pandemic. It's very pleasing to see that for the first time, the weekly number of reported deaths is now lower than when we first used the word pandemic three years ago. So the improvement or the change is significant. I'm confident that at some point this year, we will be able to say that COVID-19 is over as a public health emergency of international concern and as a pandemic. What is most important now is that we all learn the lessons of the pandemic. If we do not, we will repeat the cycle of panic and neglect that has been the hallmark of the global response to epidemics and pandemics for decades. But if we do, we can make the world safer for ourselves and for those who come after us. So what has the pandemic taught us? Let me offer three lessons. The first is the importance of public health. I think we have been discussing about this issue today almost the whole day. The pandemic is a vivid demonstration that an advanced medical care system is not the same thing as a strong public health system. Some countries with the most sophisticated medical care were overwhelmed by COVID-19 and even surprised. By contrast, some middle-income countries with fewer resources fared much better. Thanks to investments in public health after outbreaks of SARS, MERS, H1N1, and others. So they had the muscle memory, and they did better. For example, the simple art of contact tracing is one that many high-income countries have forgotten how to do it. But it's second nature to many low- and middle-income countries because of their experience with outbreaks of infectious diseases. The backbone of public health is robust primary health care. 
for detecting outbreaks at the earliest possible stage, as well as for preventing disease and promoting health at the community level. That's why WHO is calling on all countries at all income levels to invest in public health and especially in primary health care. Such investments will repay themselves many times over by preventing and mitigating the impact of epidemics and pandemics, but also by preventing or delaying the need for more costly secondary and tertiary care. The second lesson is the importance of science. Throughout the pandemic, science has given us the tools to understand how this virus spreads, how it causes disease, and how to stop it. Science enabled us to sequence the virus within days of the first reported cases and to develop tests, treatments, and vaccines faster than for any pathogen in history. And yet, in some countries and communities and on social media, the marginalization and politicization of science has impeded the response to the pandemic and caused lives. Masks, vaccines, lockdowns, and other public health measures have been deeply politicized. And the question of how the pandemic started remains unanswered. Finding the answer to this question remains a scientific imperative to help us prepare for, prevent, and respond to future epidemics and pandemics. But it is a moral imperative for the sake of those we have lost. And yet, more than three years after this outbreak started, we still don't know how, due to a lack of cooperation from China, to be transparent in sharing data and to conduct the necessary investigations and share results. I believe you have heard me say this many, many times. Until those studies are done, all hypotheses on the origins of the virus remain on the table. But if any country has information relevant to any hypothesis, it's essential for that information to be shared with WHO and the international scientific community. Which leads me to the third lesson, the importance of cooperation. At exactly the moment when the world needed to come together to face this common threat as one, the COVID-19 pandemic has been characterized by a lack of cooperation and coordination. Instead of a coherent and cohesive global response, the pandemic has been marked by a chaotic patchwork of responses. And this is because of narrow nationalism. We can only face shared threats with a shared response based on a shared commitment to solidarity and equity. That's what the pandemic accord that countries are now negotiating is all about. An agreement between nations to work in cooperation and each other, not in competition, to prepare for and respond to epidemics and pandemics. It's essential to emphasize that this accord is being negotiated by countries for countries and will be adapted and implemented by countries in accordance with their own national laws. It will not give WHO any powers to do anything without the express permission of sovereign nation states. The claim by some that this accord is an infringement of national sovereignty is quite simply wrong. The nations of the world already have numerous treaties against threats of our own making, like nuclear, chemical, 
and biological weapons, tobacco, and climate change. So surely, it makes sense for countries to agree on a common approach to a common threat that we did not fully create and cannot fully control. A threat that comes from our relationship with nature itself. It's vital that we all make an honest assessment of the pandemic and learn its lessons so we don't repeat the same mistake again. We owe it to those we have lost, the millions we have lost, and to those who will come after us, our children and grandchildren. If we make the same mistake again, then I don't think we will forgive ourselves and I don't think our kids and grandkids will also forgive us. So the pandemic accord that's being negotiated should incorporate all the lessons learned so that we don't make the same mistake again. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the founding of WHO. In the aftermath of the Second World War, nations came together in the realization that the only alternative to global conflict was global cooperation. The authors of the Constitution of the World Health Organization, itself a treaty in international law, wrote that the health for all people is fundamental to the attainment of peace and security and is dependent on the fullest cooperation of individuals and states. Those words remain as relevant today as they were in 1948, 75 years ago. The COVID-19 pandemic is a vivid demonstration that for everything that makes us different, for the reach of our diversity, we are one species sharing one planet, small planet, and one hell, and getting smaller, by the way. We have no future, but a common future. There is a famous Ethiopian proverb that says, when spider webs unite, they can tie up a lion. The challenges we face in global health can seem daunting. No single country or agency can address these challenges alone. But when we work together, we can overcome anything. Polio is a perfect example. Thank you, Mr. President. When Dr. Thomas Francis Jr. said those famous words in 1955, the vaccine is safe, effective, and potent, polio still killed and paralyzed millions of people around the world, including in the US. The idea that polio could be eradicated must have seemed a distant dream. But today, we stand on the threshold of realizing that dream. Not a single, of, single case of wild poliovirus has been reported since September last year. Of course, we are not there yet. We must stay the course and finish the job that Dr. Thomas Francis Jr. and his colleagues started. But the fact that we have come this far is not due to Dr. Thomas Francis Jr.'s alone or one vaccine alone. It's due to collaboration of many partners over many years. This is the kind of collaboration we had in Ethiopia with this great university, University of Michigan. By the way, I always say, go blue. <laughs> and it's the kind of collaboration that's needed to meet every challenge in global health. I'm glad 
President Ono, uh, you said uh, hopefully the daughter of uh, Dr. Thomas Francis Jr. is uh, listening. I would like to tell you how proud I am, just as an individual, of all the things your father and his student had done. And that's why we are now in the eradication of polio where we are. So thank you, thank you so much. President Ono, Dean Bowman, Regent White, dear students, members of the faculty, dear colleagues and friends. It's with great humility and pride that I accept the Thomas Francis Jr. Medal in Global Public Health. I hope that in the next few years, we will witness the final eradication of polio and the fulfillment of Dr. Francis's legacy. I thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tedros, for those thought-provoking and inspiring uh, comments. Uh, for the final portion of today's program, we've invited an esteemed group of faculty colleagues to join us for a discussion with Dr. Tedros titled, Collective Action for a Healthier World. I'm Matthew Bolton, Senior Associate Dean for Global Public Health and a Professor of Epidemiology at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Um, and I'll be serving as the uh, panel moderator. We'll reserve the first 30 minutes uh, or so for moderated discussion, and then time allowing, uh, we'll use the last 15 minutes uh, for questions from the audience. Um, if Dr. Tedros and the panelists could join me up on the stage. Uh, while our panelists are uh, uh, getting settled, um, I wanted to quickly share something about uh, Dr. Francis, who is, of course, the namesake of the medal that's been awarded to Dr. Tedros today. It just so happens that I have Dr. Francis's desk um, in my office, uh, which is an immense um, and very imposing uh, wood desk, which arrived at the school in 1941. So it's been there for 80 years, which is the same year that the School of Public Health uh, received its original uh, charter. And I've had it in my office for about 20 years now. Um, it was on that desk that Dr. Francis conducted the field trial for the salt polio vaccine, um, which remains 70 years later, uh, one of the largest and most publicized clinical trials in history. I think many people forget, though, um, that he performed all the highly detailed calculations for that field trial completely by hand. And recall that this involved over a million and a half children, an almost unimaginably formidable task and he did it on that desk. I have to tell you, when the desk arrived in my office uh, 20 years ago, I was sure that Dr. Francis's spirit would inspire me, like him, to great scientific achievement and professional renown. Two decades later, I'm still waiting. <laughs> All right. With that, I would like to introduce our panelists. Um, uh, joining Dr. Tedros today. So at the far end, uh, we have Jody Laurie, Professor of Nursing and Associate Dean for Global Affairs uh, at the School of Public of Nursing. Uh, Professor Laurie serves as Director of the Pan American Health Organization WHO Collaborating Center and focuses her work on the design and testing of innovative models of care to improve maternal and newborn care uh, in multiple countries globally. Next to her is Jonae Khaldun, um, who is a practicing emergency medical uh, medicine physician at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit and an adjunct professor at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. She's also the former chief <coughs> medical executive of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, where she led the state's response during the first two years of the COVID pandemic. In, 19, in 2021, she was appointed to President Biden's COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. And finally, Paul Fleming, on my immediate left, Assistant Professor of Health Behavior and Health Education in the University of Michigan School of Public Health. 
Paul has previously been a consultant to the World Bank and the U.S. Agency for International Development and conducts community-based participatory research focused on addressing the root causes of racial health inequalities. Um, so all of you have uh, devoted much of your careers to the issue of health equity and addressing disparities in health. So it seems like a good place for us to begin our discussion. Uh, achieving global health equity is an aspirational goal of the health community, but assessing our progress and assuring everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible is challenging, especially against the backdrop of deadly pandemics, historic natural disasters, and tens of millions of people forced to flee due to conflict and war in their countries. If I could start with you, uh, Dr. Tedros, and ask in a time of escalating global conflict and increasing climate threats, what are some of the key signposts we should expect or want to see as indicators that we are making tangible headway in achieving health equity globally? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, if we take the, this is a very important question, the impact indicator, and the most important one is life expectancy. Um, as you know, the difference between countries who are behind, like 55 years of age, and those who are ahead around 87, this is a huge gap, almost three, 30 years, three, three decades. Uh, the most important indicator is that. But of course, in addition to that, um, the immediate could be not impact, but in terms of uh, other indicators, it's access, access to health services. That's why we're saying universal health, health uh, coverage, because uh, many uh, countries uh, have, you know, a, a problem within uh, the, their population, lack of equity to access. So even in the high income countries, by the way, COVID has exposed that. So this is a common factor for all countries that there should be access to U U universal health coverage. It could start, of course, uh, from uh, primary uh, health care. That's what we are suggesting now as a major shift for countries because 80% of the services can be accessed at primary health care level. So investing in primary health care can, can, can address that. But the other maybe developing uh, problem we see is technology. Technology, instead of now narrowing the gap or the gaps or the problem with uh, access with equity, it's actually widening it. So um, using technology to narrow the gaps in, in equity uh, would be uh, very important. Of course, I can give you a long list, but these are some of the things that we need uh, to focus on in terms of access. But the last part is on emergency. As you said, uh, during this pandemic, we have seen equity to be a major, um, a serious uh, problem. And if you take vaccine as one uh, commodity, uh, many countries, especially high-income countries, uh, have been hoarding vaccines. Um, and what we were calling vaccine nationalism. And it was, that was deliberately. Uh, and equity, especially during emergency, is, is very, very uh, uh, important because uh, as a result of lack of equity, we lost many lives. Um, and the world should really address this uh, problem. And that's why in my speech, I said in this negotiation, pandemic accord, it has to address equity. Equity should be actually um, at the center and the world has to take this um, seriously. Uh, of course, um, you know, the pandemic accord is, there is an agreement to have it a legally binding, but still there is a divide between the North and the South, especially on the equity issue. And as I said earlier, if we honestly learn our lessons, equity is one of the major problem, and we should make sure that it's included in the accord so that we don't repeat the same mistake uh, again. But in emergency, it's between life and death, by the way, when you have equity problems, when there is no 
uh, access. I think I, I will stop here and give a chance to, to colleagues. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just delighted that you accepted our award and, and welcome back to, to, hope you come back again uh, before six years. Uh, I would just add to that and say, I think it's absolutely atrocious that uh, across the globe, but also in the United States, you go within a couple of blocks um, in a community and you can see life expectancy differences of up to you know, 10, 20 years. And so absolutely, I think equity has to be um, front and center when we talk about uh, public health. You know, when I had the honor to lead Michigan's uh, COVID-19 response, we were one of the first to actually identify uh, disparities in COVID-19 cases and deaths. And, you know, one, one metric was, you know, African-Americans make up about 14% of Michigan's population, but very early was 40%, 40% of the actual uh, deaths, which is absolutely absurd. And, and we made very intentional steps to address that disparity. But I'd also say to address inequity, we have to make it be just embedded in what we do every single day, Where, whether you're in a hospital, whether you're in public health, if you have data, whatever that metric is, you should be looking at it by different demographic factors. Race is one, ethnicity is one. We should be looking at sexual orientation, gender identity, preferred language, disability status. We really have to make sure at, in all aspects of any response and any uh, public health challenge that we're looking at it across different demographic factors as well. And I'll add to that as well for the, I think it, we have to look at it from a systems approach as well. And a system isn't necessarily just the hospital. The system is the community, the home, the primary health care facility, the tertiary health care facility. How do we connect everyone that are that, that are working in those facilities and that are working in the communities to mobilize communities to access care. As you said, access has increased, but it's increased unevenly. So there are people that have very good access to care and there are people that have to travel very long distances and have very poor access to care. So I think we need to have networks of care so that communities can be connected to facilities and that we have trust between the communities but also between the providers at some of those rural health facilities and some of the more tertiary or major facilities so that they can communicate to one another and we can get the best health care and the best quality care for everybody and not just the people that are living closest to the tertiary health care facilities. Yeah, and I think those are really excellent points. And the only thing I'd add to it is just really thinking not just about the indicators of health or indicators of healthcare access, but also really what are the root causes that are creating the inequities in the first place? What's creating the conditions where some people are able to access life-saving services and others aren't? Um, and so really the metrics or the indicators I would be thinking about is, have we made progress on structural racism? Have we made progress on wealth inequality? Um, some of those bigger foundational causes. Jody, I want to circle back to you because you've done a lot of work in maternal child health um, uh, utilizing interventions in a human rights framework. What does it mean or look like uh, to apply a human rights context to the issue of uh, health equity? I think Dr. Tedros mentioned when the WHO Constitution was formed in 1948, one of the inclus inclusive things of that was that health care was a human right. And I think that has been where I have come from in the work that I have done, that healthcare can't be a commodity. It has to be a human right. It has to be everyone's right to have a healthy life and to be able to access the care that they need and to get equitable quality care, no matter where they're living, no matter what their condition is. I think if you look at maternal child health, we have signposts for that. We have the Millennium Development Goals. We had them. We have the Sustainable Development Goals. We are still three times higher of what the goal for the maternal mortality is. And 300,000 women continue to die every year from childbirth-related complications. That's 800 women a day. And 70% of those women live in Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's a huge inequity that we need to look at and we need to think about it in a human, a human rights framework to, to actually be sure that they're getting the care that they need so that they can have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy outcome. Uh, before we move on to another uh, uh, topic, I, uh, uh, Jonay, I, I wanted to 
ask you about, you've had an extensive background in public sector work and, and governmental public health, um, but you've also worked in the private sector. And what role can or should industry play in shaping health policy, a policy to encourage equitable health goals? Yeah, I, I think, you know, even before, you know, I, I left my government role, I, I would always say that the work of public health is not just about the work of the governmental public health uh, department. And I think for companies, um, if you didn't know before the COVID-19 pandemic, you found out that you have to be in the business of health. And I think particularly the health of your workforce. So I think things like making sure you're creating uh, a healthy workspace, right? Companies had to really think hard about that in ways that they never did before the pandemic. But it's also about appropriate health care coverage and making sure not just those at the top, um, at the top of an organization, but also those frontline workers, those who may be lower income at a company also have access to uh, broad health insurance coverage. That's really, really important. Access to child care, talking about those social drivers of health, child care, uh, being able to take a day off so you can go to your actual medical appointment. It's not just about access and being close, right, proximity. It's also about can you actually take off and still keep your job, right? So I think that's really, really important. But I also think, and again, we learned this throughout the pandemic, companies absolutely have a role to play, whether it's the expertise of the people who work within that company, whether it's supplies, right? We learned about that throughout the pandemic, but there are a lot of things that I think companies can actually do to advance broader community health goals. And I hope that that's one thing we learned as a society is that it is not just about governmental public health. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to transition our discussion, although it also relates to, to health equity. Uh, just last week at President Ono's inauguration, which incidentally I attended in person and in its entirety, um, he uh, described climate change, if I recall correctly, as the existentialist challenge of our time. And I think all of us would agree that not a day goes by that we don't read or hear about some new extreme weather event related calamity somewhere around the world. And of course, climate change comes with enormous health implications for everyone um, everywhere. Um, Dr. Tedros, if I could start with you again, what should the global health community be doing in the here and now uh, to mitigate the potential health impacts of climate change, especially with respect to preventing or at least reducing death and disability to the greatest extent possible? Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Before I move to that, maybe I would like to uh, just say a few words about uh, health and the human right. Um, I think countries who have recognized health as a fundamental human right uh, have, are making progress, and they put it in their constitution. But in addition to that, it's not only it's a human right and end in itself, it's also a means to development. So it's you know, we need to consider both. Countries should consider both, actually, when uh, they, uh, you know, in order to take uh, health uh, seriously. But the rights issue, the fundamental human rights, is, is really key. And when I was, um, this is in 1988, when I visited Denmark for the first time, actually traveling outside my country, uh, I got one-year insurance, although I stayed there, health insurance, although I stayed there for four months. And I was really surprised that Denmark gives, um, covers health insurance uh, even for its guests um, and full insurance, full, full health insurance. Um, you go to any health facility, you get all the services, you don't pay a penny. It's all covered. And that's actually how I became a believer of universal health coverage. If Denmark can do it, anyone can do it. By the way, United Kingdom with the NHS, they did that immediately after the Second World War. This is the Lord Beveridge um, uh, model, the, the, the NHS, when its economy was in ruins. Uh, but the key for the UK at that time was it recognized it as a fundamental human right. And that made a difference. And if you see um, NHS, always uh, you see in the UK a bipartisan position uh, on, on, on NHS. So, um, you know, linking it with the human rights, seeing it from that lens is important. Then to climate change. 
climate change and health. Climate, a climate crisis is a health crisis. One of the challenges we face now is, especially those who deny climate change, we're not able, the, the, way, the reason they're exploiting it is, we, we're not able to connect climate and health and show to the citizens of the world how it's already impacting their health. I think that's key if we're going to uh, fight it in our uh, approach, one, to uh, put the two and experts from two, the two sides come and work together and then show uh, to the world the damage that's happening due to climate change. And the other uh, part is when we show to the world, simple messages are important. I remember this is many years ago when um, Schwarzenegger was the governor of California. He had a very famous poster where we, which showed a child unable to breathe with ventilator. And this is because of the increased prevalence of um, air pollution that was affecting kids. I mean, the increased prevalence of asthma because of, because of air pollution. And many people didn't believe, didn't know the connection and they started to, to really understand. So it's not actually after climate change happened. Even before climate change, the air pollution that brings climate change has impact on health. Then climate change, it's well established, impact on non-communicable and communicable disease is also clear. So we need to explain the whole cycle and how that's impacting uh, the health of our our uh, communities. Then the other uh, important issue in climate change and health is we have to see the mitigation and the adaptation part. We, we, we have to do both. It's not uh, either or. And from the health sector side, of course, we can show what should be done, but at the same time, the health sector itself should do it because the health sector contributes 5% to the um, carbon emission. So the, the health sector itself should do, show, and the rest can also advocate for, for the rest uh, to do it. Um, I, would, I would say this approach would, would, would help. And we have also a coalition of healthy cities, um, which are working now on climate and health connected, and we hope this will uh, bring more, 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 more change. So the connection is clear and the, the issue is we have to, uh, you know, use it uh, more aggressively. Thank you. Uh, this is for any one of the panelists uh, who wants to respond, but as we come up with these mitigation strategies, how do we best account for the significant differences and disparities among countries in their capacity to cope with the potential health fallout from climate change? Yeah, I, I can start here. Um, actually, this discussion of climate change, it's, it's um, something that Dr. Tedros has been saying um, throughout the day is this idea of a generational agreement where what we're doing now is really work for future generations. And that really this, this discussion of climate change and um, makes me think about that and connects with also with the idea from indigenous communities in the U.S. of thinking seven generations ahead. So if we think about our great-grandchildren or our great-great-greats, what kind of questions are they going to ask us? And I think especially this issue of um, global inequities and variation in the impacts of climate change, what kind of questions are the future generations going to ask us about what we're doing about that inequity, about some of the wealthier countries and how they've contributed to climate change, which has been disproportionately affecting poorer countries, um, so I think this idea of a generational agreement and really taking the actions today that are going to benefit generations in the future um, so that we can um, answer those questions with confidence that we did do uh, what we needed to do in this moment. I would just add to that. I think it's 
absolutely the health sector, but it's also what you talked about earlier, building wealth in communities. Climate change impacts everyone. But it's often those who are left behind, poor, lower socioeconomic status that actually can't rebuild after some type of extreme heat event or a hurricane flood, et cetera. So I think really making sure we are addressing resiliency in every community is really, really important. Also looking at chronic diseases. Again, it was a risk factor for having more extreme, uh, severe COVID-19. It's the same thing with climate change. Change. Uh, if you are more likely to have high blood pressure, chronic conditions, you're going to be ha being on uh, medications and more likely to be vulnerable to those events. So I think it's again about resiliency for entire communities. And I would just add that those of us in high income countries have to be advocates and, and activists to try to be sure that low income countries or countries with fewer resources are actually prepared and are able to mitigate some of the some of the um, things that will happen because of, of climate change. And also to have the population as healthy as possible. Because as you say, people with chronic disease and people who have um, underlying conditions are really going to be affected the most when there's heat intensity or there's, they have to move because there's flooding and, and those sorts of things. You know, one of the, 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 one of the health fallouts from climate change is uh, the implications for, for mental health and, you know, in grappling with the, the many challenges associated with promoting and ensuring physical health, the health community um, has often given far less consideration or even neglected uh, mental health. And it seems clear that we are dramatically under-resourced to meaningfully confront the burden of mental illness-related disability, especially on a global scale. Uh, we've spent the last three years dealing with the stress and pressures of a pandemic. Uh, there is historically large number of refugees and other displaced persons fleeing conflict. The impact of climate change is everywhere and inter-country political tensions seem to be worsening. In the collective, we have the makings of a global mental health crisis of an unprecedented degree. And so I would ask the panelists and open it up to all of you, is it reasonable to think that the health community can marshal the financial resources to more systematically address mental health issues globally? And does that entail a special responsibility of high income countries like the US and others to ensure that such resources are made available, especially to lower income countries? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can start. Okay. <laughs> um, I think the mental health problem is um, becoming very, very serious. Of course, be, even before the pandemic, one in six adult uh, working age um, has been affected by some sort of mental disorder. Uh, now, after the, the pandemic, uh, there were some reports that um, depression and anxiety increased by 25%. I think it could even be more. And this is because of COVID. Uh, but not only COVID, many conflict areas, uh, you see um, really serious problems. I have been to Ukraine. I think the impact will continue for many years. Um, I met families who were trapped in Mariupol, and I saw how the kids were affected. It's, it's very, very sad. And then recently I was in Syria, in the earthquake affected areas. Of course, the earthquake is lesser evil. Um, they have been at war for 12 years and drove from Aleppo to Damascus. Town after town, it was destroyed because of the war, but then the earthquake um, in the areas controlled by the opposition as well, in Idlib area, even worse. Most of the population is displaced, around 4.1 million. And when you look into their eyes, anyone you meet there, <coughs> it's, it's what you see is um, a really empty spirit, uh, something very, very worrisome. And they feel like they're trapped and they don't have any way 
out of, of, of that trap. And its mental health impact anyone can imagine. It's war, it's drought, economic collapse, COVID, now earthquake. Whether it's in the government control or opposition, it's, it's all the same. Then you can bring many examples, by the way. In the Middle East, many countries, Yemen, then in Africa, including Ethiopia, you know, the conflict in, uh, in, in Tigray, and of course the rest of uh, the world, its mental health impact will be very, very uh, serious. So um, I think, as you rightly said, we need to have a response which is also massive because the problem is becoming massive. And there is no help without mental health. Um, and what you really indicated is key. If the problem is massive, then the resources you need will also be massive. And that's why countries like the U.S. and other uh, high-income countries and donors who can support uh, should really uh, give this a serious uh, attention because without resources, um, you know, we, we cannot have any impact. Uh, and the reason why we need investment and the, the investment would be massive is not because of only the magnitude of the problem, but because of the investment which is needed also without even the increase in the magnitude. Because traditionally, health, you know, mental health is managed in high, what do you call it, secondary or tertiary level services and not really mainstreamed in the health system. But if you try to mainstream it, that's what we're now suggesting to countries, because those countries who have mainstreamed it are making progress, you will need a lot of money. Because starting from the primary health care, from the community, you need to invest. And uh, that will uh, be a massive investment. So the resources you said will be very important. But the key in mental health is fighting the pandemic, but we're, uh, fighting the stigma. Fighting the stigma family level, fighting the stigma community level, and fighting the stigma even in the health system itself. Because people with mental health problems are considered as criminals and treated as criminals, which is really, really wrong. And fighting stigma itself will need uh, resources. So uh, the attention you said by those who can uh, avail resources will be very important, but it's, it's time now to give the right attention to mental health. It's the growing, um, you know, problem is so, so worrisome. Thank you. And I, I'll add that there are models out there that have been very successful in integrating mental health into primary health care. Uh, for example, the Carter Center did a, a program in Liberia where they trained nurses and midwives as first-line providers for the more common mental health issues that when the people would come in for care at the primary health care facility. But again, it takes many resources to do that training to get people um, trained up in, in the skills that they need. But once that happens, they become the advocates for the community and they really can make a huge difference in their own, in their own communities. I would just add, I think we really need to also think about our children and our youth and embedding mental health prevention, screening, and treatment into our schools and into our child health services as well. I think that's really, really important and sometimes missing from, from the conversation. Yeah, and I think we, we need to, I think certainly some major investments are needed in thinking about addressing stigma from within our field, our, our fields in the healthcare. Um, but also really thinking about what do communities look like that facilitate good mental health? We know that social connectedness, social support are, are key factors for promoting good, um, good mental health. And in a lot of ways, the policies, our economic systems are driving people to be disconnected, to not be as supported. And so we really need to think about how our communities, our society is operating so that we are connected, we are supporting one another, we do have more of a community, because um, that's really gonna drive good mental health outcomes um, for a long time to come. I think what we had in mind, I think we uh, were planning to open it up to questions from our audience. Um, and if you have a question, be sure and use the handheld uh, <laughs> microphone. I see one over there.
Hello, my name is Hamza. I'm an undergraduate a junior at the University of Michigan uh, studying public health and biology. My question is for Dr. Tidros. So first of all, thank you so much for visiting us here and thank you for all the work that you've done over the past few years in a very selfless manner. Uh, my question is that from your experiences working with people from a wide uh, variety of cultures, cultures and backgrounds, how do you believe we should apply cultural relativism when dealing with public health issues while also not compromising the core tenets of like science and medicine. So the question really is that where should we be drawing the line uh, between cultural relativism and dedication to what we believe is actually the best course of action in dealing with a specific global health issue? Thank you. I think that question was directed to you, Dr. Tedros. Yeah, thank you. No, I, would, I thought you were want to ask to add more questions or you want to one by one? Uh, one, we do, one by one. Okay. Yeah. So on, on culture, I think um, uh, one thing that uh, should be uh, at the center is, you know, we, we have to see it country by country the cultural issues could come from there. For instance, any country has it, you know, knows the problems it faces. It knows also the um, root cause of the problems and then can propose the uh, solutions. So if this, um, uh, you know, the solution that they propose in each country is tailored to their, to their, to their culture, I don't think there will be a, a, a problem. The problem starts when we don't, when there is um, prescription from outside, it's something that was studied in other settings and trying to, um, you know, implement it in a setting that doesn't uh, uh, accept or that doesn't really um, take the the model from which is coming from elsewhere. So the, the country ownership and understanding the, by the country itself, understanding their problems, the root cause and the, so their solutions actually helps in addressing the cultural issues at, at, at the same time. Um, the, so when we have models, instead of prescribing uh, models that are tested elsewhere, first we should really make sure that the um, uh, country or, or groups or communities um, understand how they understand their own problems and come up with solutions that could be new or something that modifies the model that, that, that we're uh, proposing. Other panelists, comments? I guess I, I would just add um, that, you know, part of that question made me think about that sometimes we think about science happening here and then community happening here and really we need to think about the integration of those two things and how do scientists collaborate within communities, build trust, and then work together on um, answering the important questions for that community or for that, that area. And I think that's really for a long term when we're thinking about um, you know, doing public health and uh, addressing pandemics, addressing emergencies, that trust building up front is really going to be a critical aspect. I would just add in, in public health, uh, respect and humility is very, very important. It's one thing to have the paper, to have the PhD, to have the title, but when you're going into communities, you really have to uh, respect on the same level the lived experiences of those people who are in those communities because they also sense that. They sense when you think that, that uh, you're better than them or they don't know anything. So I think that's really, really important and something that we have to embed in our practice as public health professionals. And you just have to listen to them, right? Because communities know what their problems are, and they usually even know the solution, but they just lack some of the technical expertise or maybe the funding or maybe some way of putting it all together to actually address what the problem is. So I think um, it's just really important to sit on your hands and, and listen at first. Mm. I think I saw another question over, yeah. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Tenzer. And um, uh, we both, we all know that uh, you know, climate change is a very complex and complicated question. There are too many, many things to do. So I wonder what things do you think are the most important and the most urgent to cope with in current stage? Thank you. Are you clear about the question? Repeat. Was that directed to a specific panelist? Can you repeat the question? So the question was, if I, we were hearing, we have a little bit of difficulty hearing up here. Um, what was the, what's the most important or concrete things that should be done first to tackle climate change? Yeah. <laughs> panelists? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think the f first, I don't know what the first could be, but um, um, I think we have to do both mitigation and, and adaptation. And as you know, uh, the um, mitigation can uh, give actually better, better returns because uh, you're preventing um, problems from from happening or from the problem from uh, deteriorating. Uh, so uh, if we do investments, of course the adaptation is important, but it, we should focus on, on mitigation. That's how we can target also the 1.5 uh, degree centigrade, uh, you know, which wor the world, of course, agreed that could be that should be met, but unless we focus on mitigation, we cannot, we cannot achieve that. While focusing on mitigation, of course, we should do adaptation uh, in order to minimize the impact, but the preferred one cannot be the adaptation. Of course, you should do the adaptation in order to minimize impact and to create resilient systems, but if you ask me from the two, our focus should be on, on uh, mitigation. Other questions? Yeah, Ravi. So this is a question to Dr. Tedros. Um, we've been talking a lot about what countries need to do from in the future for preparedness, etc. My question is, having gone through the pandemic, what has WHO itself learned? And what internal changes the WHO needs to make to perhaps respond better next time around a pandemic happens? So more internal to the organization itself. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as you know, um, you remember the Ebola, the Western Africa Ebola in 2014. Um, and based on lessons from, from that, WHO has really invested a lot. And the, emer the emergency program we have now is much different than we used to have in 2014. And we have been building on it uh, uh, regularly. So one of the changes we have done is uh, WHO can now be on the ground quickly and resources can be deployed quickly. We have what we call the contingency funds for emergency and the emergency chief can sign it and within 24 hours of the report of the emergency and, uh, you know, uh, experts can, can be on the ground within 48 to 72 hours. Uh, so it's, it's really fast. I will tell you one, one story, especially in agility and flexibility and speed. Um, when, when before Russia invaded Ukraine, we were discussing about the likelihood. But we didn't believe that that would happen. But we said in the unlikely event that Russia would invade Ukraine, we need to preposition supplies. And we did. We prepositioned supplies and the invasion happened. As soon as the invasion happened, we started to use stocks from uh, in, inside, the, from the prepositioned supplies. So one thing that we need to continue to improve in WHO is to, you know, the speed is, is very uh, uh, important. 
And if you take the, the, um, the flooding in Pakistan, the Ebola recently in Uganda, uh, and, and other emergencies, uh, we, we're, we're really moving fast. But that, you cannot say is finished. This is something you do continuously, and continuous improvement is, is very, very important. And the other is surveillance. We're strengthening our surveillance capacity. That's one of the lessons we have learned even from this. And we, we have already established a Berlin hub. Collective intelligence is very important. But at the same time, in addition to have this collective intelligence, a global hub uh, that will focus in surveillance, uh, we're also helping countries to build their capacity because it's the, the, the strengths of uh, surveillance in each country that can bring the global strengths of uh, surveillance. Um, and I was saying it in the previous, um, in earlier, um, what do you call it, panels, we are as strong as the weakest link. So we have to have strong surveillance systems uh, in, in countries. And the global hub that we created in, in Berlin can, can, can support that. Surveillance is, is, is uh, going to be really uh, key. Uh, but there are other lessons that uh, the, we, we have learned, of course, I can take the, this as, as two important uh, ones for uh, emergencies, but there are other lessons that we, we, we have learned and which we are in, in implementing. We already started implementing. We didn't want to wait, uh, for instance, uh, biohab, sharing of biological materials as soon as possible. That can help you to um, produce kits um, for, for testing or to produce vaccines. So the biohab is created as a, in a pilot phase and we're encouraging countries to share uh, materials also, not only through surveillance, sharing of uh, information. And the other mechanism which we believe is very important is the peer review mechanism we have established to see the capacity of countries and then help them based on the gaps we see. And this was inspired by the human rights, um, uh, what do you call it, council approach, the peer review mechanism, um, w which we believe is helping and many countries are now, are now using it. So as I said earlier, learning from our lessons from this pandemic is important. And we are doing that, and we have to be honest in our learning. Um, and we wouldn't say to the member states, learn from the lessons without doing it ourselves. So we, we are already doing it our, ourselves, and we are learning the, uh, from the mistakes or, or the failures that, that we had. I see there are additional questions, but unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, Please join me in thanking Dr. Tedros and the other panelists. Thank you. And I believe uh, Dean Bowman's going to provide some closing remarks. Yeah. One more time for a terrific panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much again for being here. Thanks to those of you joining us by the live stream uh, for uh, joining into a wonderful session. President Ono, Regent White, thank you for also being here. I'd also like to acknowledge again the selection and planning committees and then Dr. Tedros. Uh, I really appreciate all of uh, the remarks that you've made, the insights that you've delivered throughout the day, uh, and thank you for, for joining us, as well as to the rest of, of, of the panel as well. Health is a human right. If we all accept that as a, as a challenge, and it's up to all of us uh, for our collective action to try to drive solutions. So uh, we'll end on that note. For those of you who are here in person, we will have a reception in the lobby, so feel free to join us for that as well. Thank you. <laughs>